What's funny is this module is supposed to be about DC circuits, but so far we've just been talking a lot about batteries. Well, now we're ready to combine our detailed knowledge of these three components here and start creating actual real world DC circuits. Uh, well, almost. We still have to figure out how to deal with multiple resistors. But even before that, we haven't actually said anything about DC circuits in particular. What is a DC circuit? DC just stands for direct current. In a DC circuit, the current is only traveling in a single direction at some point in the circuit. Like in this circuit here, we see the current is only traveling clockwise through all points in the circuit. In electronic theory, we got DC circuits and we got AC circuits or alternating current circuits. The way an AC circuit works is we have the current following a sinusoidal pattern like this where the current oscillates back and forth. We'll talk a lot more about AC circuits much later. We'll have a whole module dedicated to it. But for now, DC circuits are a bit simpler, so we'll start with those. Now then, how to deal with multiple resistors. We're going to use a lot of the same terminology from when we were dealing with multiple capacitors. Namely, we're going to be talking about series and parallel configurations of resistors. Also, all the same rules we use for determining elements in series or branches in parallel apply to resistors as well. So if you're not familiar with those rules, I would maybe rewatch that video with multiple capacitors. So now, without mincing words, consider three resistors in series with a battery. We have a closed circuit here, so current is going to be flowing, and it's going to be the same current in each resistor and the battery. Why? Well, consider if the current were different in different places, like higher in one region and lower in another region. Then over time we would have a buildup of charge somewhere, and that's highly unstable in a DC circuit with thin wiring. Charges really don't want to do that, even when they're moving in a closed circuit. So if the current is the same through each of the resistors, we can write the magnitude of the potential difference across the first resistor as I times R1. And the potential difference across the second resistor is I times R2 and so on for the third resistor. What we want to do is turn this combination of three resistors in series into an equivalent resistor. So we ask ourselves, what would be the equivalent resistance of this resistor such that it has the same resistance as this entire combination of three resistors in series? Well, the current would have to be the same through the equivalent resistor as it is through each of the series resistors, otherwise it wouldn't behave the same way as the combination of resistors in which case our quest would be useless. By the same logic, we expect the potential difference across the equivalent resistor to be the same as the potential difference across the entire series resistor combination. We know the magnitude of the potential difference across the equivalent resistance is just the current times the equivalent resistance. Back to the series case, giving letters for the electric potential at each of these points, we have V sub A, V sub B, V sub C, and V sub D. Then recognizing that the electric potential is actually higher where the current is going into the resistor versus where it's coming out, because of what we talked about in the previous module, we have some of that electric potential being lost to produce heat and sometimes light. We can write the voltage drop or the positive amount of electric potential that's lost as V sub A minus V sub B for the first resistor. For the next resistor, we can do similar, and we have V sub B minus V sub C. For the third resistor, we have V sub C minus V sub D. Since we expect the electric potential to stay the same on each side of the resistor combination when we replace it with our equivalent resistor, that means the left side has electric potential V sub A, and the right side has electric potential V sub D then the voltage drop across the equivalent resistor is V sub A minus V sub D. Now, how do we relate all these expressions to each other? We've got ourselves into a bit of a pickle with all this A, B, C, D stuff going on. Hmm, what do we do now? It turns out if we add the voltage drops across each of the three resistors in series, the VBs cancel and the VCs cancel, and we're left with V sub A minus V sub D, which is just the same as the potential difference across the equivalent resistor.
So the voltage drops across the individual resistors in series add up to give us the voltage drop across the equivalent resistor. Since each voltage drop has a positive value here, we can substitute them all with I times R for each respective resistor, like I1, R1, I2, R2, and so on. Then, the current going through each resistor is the same, it's just I. So dividing by the current on both sides gives us the equivalent resistance as a function of the original series combination of resistances. The equivalent resistance across a resistor combination in series is just the algebraic sum of all of the resistances. The same logic extends to n resistors in series. We saw a similar pattern when we were dealing with capacitors in parallel. The capacitance is added up to give you the equivalent capacitance across a parallel combination of capacitors. It's quite interesting that we have that kind of flip-flop there between the series resistors and parallel capacitors. So what do you think resistors in parallel will look like? Well, let's find out. Imagine we have three resistors in parallel, and we want to figure out what the equivalent resistance in parallel is. Here the potential difference across each resistor is the same, because we treat potential as constant along empty wire. So we have V sub L all over the left side, and V sub R all over the right side. Because the equivalent resistance has to behave the same as the parallel combination, it has potentials V, L, and V, R as well. So the potential differences or voltage drops across everything here are the same. What about the current though? The current going through this entire collection might have started out as I, but now it has to be split up into three different currents, I1, I2, and I3. We saw a similar thing with capacitors in parallel in that the charge had to split up between the capacitors. If charge has to split up, current has to split up too, since current is really just the flow of charge. In that case, the sum of the currents that split up have to all add up for us to get back our original current I. And this current I has to be the same as the current that goes through the equivalent resistor in order for it to behave the same way as the parallel combination then the current through the equivalent resistor is the sum of the currents through each of the resistors in parallel. For each resistor, we can say that the current through that resistor is the voltage drop across it divided by the resistance of that resistor. Then, since the voltage drops across each of the resistors are the same, we can just call them all delta V, for instance. Now, dividing by the same voltage drop gives us our expression for the equivalent resistance. In the case of parallel resistances, the inverse of the equivalent resistance is equal to the algebraic sum of the inverse of each resistance in parallel. And of course, we can extend this logic to n resistors in parallel. Again, this is kind of topsy-turvy with respect to how capacitors behave. We saw capacitors in series are expressed by inverse capacitances like this. Here we have resistors in parallel that are expressed by a similar kind of relationship. Of course, in actual circuits, we're not going to just have series or just parallel configurations. We'll usually be dealing with some awkward combination of the two. So in order to simplify these circuits, we apply our knowledge piecewise, one step at a time across whatever sub-circuits we can find, just like how we dealt with capacitors.